very good morning again. So this month of um, August, what I want, what God wants us to pray about is having the vision about your destiny and your purpose in life. So God wants to reveal to you your destiny and your purpose. So that's what we are going to see as a, a series throughout this month of August so that you, we can explain truly in uh, what is the plan of God, what is his destiny for every believer, what is his destiny for the individual, what is his uh, purpose for every believer, and what is uh, his purpose for an individual. We would take examples as far as individuals are concerned because we are all different. You are not a copy of um, uh, another person. You are unique. So we are going to see what is a general destiny of a, every mankind, what is uh, the general purpose for which God created uh, mankind, and what is uh, the specific purpose for your life, what is the specific destiny for your life, you need to find it out, and what is that the, the purpose of what God, of that destiny. So we need to know it. And uh, these are the things that need to be settled uh at the very beginning of your christian faith so that you have a vision that's why i'm saying having a vision habakkuk chapter 2 uh, so from verse 2 to verse 4 tells us uh, that to write down the vision the vision about your destiny the vision about the purpose that god has for that destiny make it plain that he may run who reads it so as you'll be reading that vision of your destiny and the purpose of it, you'll be running with it. The proud in his heart is uplifted, but the just shall live by faith. So though that vision uh, tarries, wait for it, because at the end, it's going to speak for itself, and it will not lie. So we want to seek the face of the Lord so that we will know what our destiny is and the purpose for that destiny. And that way we'll be able to run with endurance, the race, our own race, not someone else's race. Because sometimes we are trying to copy other people, comparing our life with the life of other people, comparing the church that we have with the church of other people. Those who compare themselves with others, Paul says to the Corinthian church, they are not wise. So it is now uh, very crucial that I discover, I have a vision of my destiny and the purpose of that destiny. I have the vision of my life and the, uh, the purpose of my life here on earth. I have the vision of uh, the, the, the destiny of, this, of my marriage, of my children, and the purpose uh, of, uh, of marriage, the reason why God created it. So that's what we want to, to see this month. And that's what you are going to be praying for and seeking the face of the Lord for, having a vision about uh, your destiny and the purpose of that destiny. Now, uh, the Bible says, the first thing is you and I, we need to know what our destiny is and what is the, uh, its purpose. We need to know it. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 29, I'm reading from the New King James. It says, where there is no revelation, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraints. But happy is he who keeps the law. The Amplified said, he says, where there is no vision, because a revelation is a prophetic um, vision. A prophetic vision is a revelation. That's why the book of uh, uh, a revelation is called uh, a revelation because it was a vision that Paul saw, John saw concerning uh, the church, concerning the future of the world. That's what they call it, uh, revelation. This apocalyptos, in French it is ap uh, apocalypse. So apocalyptos in Greek simply means uh, vision or revelation, prophetic uh, revelation. God is telling the destiny of the church, the destiny of the world, and the purpose for that destiny in the book of uh, Revelation. So where there is no revelation, the people cast off a restraint. So uh, I amplified uh, says, where there is no vision, no revelation of God and his word, 
you discover your purpose, your purpose about your life, your purpose of being born in the word of God. So if you don't have the word of God, it is hard for you to discover your destiny and your purpose in life. And you will be uh, so, and the people are unrestrained. Like uh, Pastor Rosemary testified when she was uh, praying and thanking, uh, I think it was she was praying, she mentioned the uh, Joseph case because he had the vision about his destiny. That's why he did not fornicate because he knew where he was going. Why will he settle for less? So he could restrain himself. He could discipline himself. An athlete has a vision that he's going to win the Olympics. That's why he has a disciplined life. He needs to wake up at a certain time and train. His life is disciplined because he's looking at the, the price, the Olympics. First of all, he needs to qualify to the Olympics and then run that Olympic and win that Olympic. So his eyes are really focused on the goal. And uh, he does not eat junk food because it's going to affect his uh, body. So his diet is uh, very strict because uh, it has uh, a purpose, a purpose. He, so he knows the vision about uh, his destiny and uh, he has a purpose for it, to glorify Great Britain when he's going to win that uh, gold medal. And Great Britain will be so proud that uh, he won it, but he also will be glorified because he's the one that won it for Great Britain. So the kingdom is glorified, but the athlete also is glorified. God also must be glorified in that purpose, and you also are going to be glorified. You are going to share in the glory of God. Jesus said, the glory which my father gave me, I've also given them that same glory. If you suffer with me for the sake of my kingdom, you're also going to reign with me. Just like the athlete, it is the nation that is glorified, but the athlete also is glorified. So, but when people don't have a revelation about uh, the, the destiny and the purpose of it, they live a life like dogs. They live an aimless life. And they go in circle even for 40 years, not discovering what is the destiny and the purpose. And once you know your destiny and your purpose, you also have a part to play. For instance, in the heart of the parent, when they send a child to, to, to college, they are, and they paid for the tuition fees, the parents uh, were already seeing the child graduating from that college or from that university. They paid for it. Uh, in America, it is even more expensive than in the, the in UK. In the UK, it is more expensive than in, uh, in Europe. So they are already seeing in their dreams. They paid for it. They paid for that destiny to have a graduate son, to have uh, a son that has an A-level, a daughter that has an A-level, that has a bachelor degree, a master degree, uh, that is becoming a nurse. So they are already seeing the destiny, the future of the child. But now, the child can decide to sabotage his own uh, destiny. Not the fault of the parent, they paid for it. They paid the tuition fees, they paid his accommodation, they paid uh, uh, everything that he needs to, to be able to eat and support himself, they paid everything. Now, if he decides to go to college and be partying and not studying, whose fault is that? The fault of the parents or the fault of uh, the, um, uh, the son or the daughter? The fault of the son. The destiny was a set for him to succeed, to graduate. But he could not discipline himself. He could not restrain himself. So he blew up uh, that... Uh, bright destiny that the, the parent have. So now the parent will try to come up with plan B. Okay, uh, he has been fired from uh, Glasgow University, from Caledonia University, from uh, uh, Sterling University. So let us bring him down in England. Maybe they will take him to one of the universities. And there also he goes there to party and so on and so forth. Okay, now maybe we should uh, find plan C, plan D. But the initial destiny that the person has, he blew it up. Or uh, now when he would come to his senses, he would say, okay, father, let me go back again. This time I'm going to be serious. I have some maturity. You and, uh, and I will need to take responsibility over the destiny and the purpose of that destiny that God reveres to us. 
it will not automatically happen without our cooperation. Just like the fact that you pay the tuition fees for your son uh, to go to uni doesn't mean that he's going to graduate. He has to do the work. You can't do it for him. You pay the price. Jesus also paid the price for us to have access. By his death, access was granted to all the promises of God, and all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. But you have a part to play. And if you don't play your part, the Holy Spirit will not be able to play it. God will not be able to play it. The Holy Spirit will work through you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it is God that works in you both to will and to do, or is it good pleasure? He's working through you. He's working in you. He's not working apart from you. He needs your cooperation. We are co-laborers with Christ Jesus. We are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Or we are yoked together with him. As he's plowing, we need to be plowing in the field as well for our destiny to come to pass. So, first of all, we need to define basic words uh, like uh, destiny and purpose. I've come to know that sometimes we speak French or we speak English, but we do not know the meaning of those words. When I came to France, uh, I would be speaking and most of my peers would not understand what I was saying. Uh, not because of the accent, because they used to say that they have a Belgium accent, uh, but because they did not, they were using the words, but they did not uh, know the meaning of those words. So many of the teachers that we had were in the 70s, uh, 60s, they were so happy with me because I knew the meaning of the word. So I had to explain to my, my friends, the French, okay, this is what it means, this is what it means. So I discovered that people know they use words, but they don't know the meaning of it. And the, the Bible also it is the same thing. When we use words, we don't know the meaning of it. We would not fully really understand what God is saying to us. When I started to write the Bible study of my weekly meal as well, I would write them in English and Sister Louise will uh, be editing them. And she's, she's an English lady born in New York. And then she would ask me a question. What is the meaning of a portion? When you always say, this is not my portion and so on. So I said, can, don't you understand this? Now, though she has an MBA, so I understood that the fact that you have a master of business administration does not, and you are English born, does not mean that you understand some words, because the Bible has its own words uh, that uh, the secular world would not understand, and there are other words also that we keep on using. We don't know the meaning. So when you are studying the Bible, have a dictionary uh, close to you so that you can check the meaning of those words. Even if it, you've been using that word for a long time, check it. You'll be amazed at the detail that you would find for the meaning of uh, that word. And you'll be able to understand what God truly wants for you. Now, the word destiny, because we want to have a vision, having a vision about your destiny and uh, the purpose of that destiny. The word destiny is the events, uh, events that uh, will necessarily happen to a particular person or a thing. So your destiny are already events that are going to necessarily happen to you. God has already planned them. He has already paid for them. For instance, it is the, 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 the destiny of everyone to be born and the destiny of anyone to die. So you can't escape birth and the death. That one you can't. It is necessary for everyone. Unless Christ comes back and then we are raptured, that's the destiny of everyone. It is a common. Now, what we do in between, the, the purpose of that, that destiny of being on earth here is what we need to discover. If we take uh, uh, the word now purpose, it is the reason for which something is done the reason for which something is done or the reason for which something is created or for which something exists. So why do we exist on earth? Why did God create marriage? The, the purpose of marriage, I think we've covered them uh, in length in the foundation for Christian marriage. So please visit that Bible study foundation for Christian uh, uh, marriage so that you can know the purpose, the reason why God created the marriage. So there is a, a purpose 
like Ecclesiastes um, or oh, uh, free tells us uh, there is a purpose for everything. There's a time and uh, God has a purpose for things that he creates. So God created you not purposeless. You have uh, a purpose in your life. Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, verse 11 to verse 13, is God is saying to the, his people that were in captivity, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. They are thoughts of peace, shalom, restoration, nothing missing, nothing broken, not of evil. I don't have an evil thought for you to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call. That's now your responsibility to discover that, uh, that destiny and uh, the purpose of it. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. That's your job to pray. Go and pray, God, what is my destiny? What is the set of events that you already, that are necessary to happen in my life? If I know them, then I know how to run my life. I know how to restrain myself because I would have a vision. And uh, but because without the vision, I would cast off restraint. I would go into a direction when you don't want me to go to that direction. So, uh, and, I will, and I will listen to you. So God, when you will seek his face, he will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me at one condition when you search for me with all your heart. I don't know how long it's going to take, but seek the face of the Lord. God, what is my destiny and what is its purpose? Joseph had a dream about his destiny, how people would bow to him, the stars, the moons, uh, the, the, star, the, the stars, the moon, and the sun would bow to him. So he knew the destiny, but did not know the purpose. So he became proudful because he did not know the purpose of it. God wanted to lift him up so that he can save the world. First of all, his own family, from the family that was coming and preserve them for so that the Messiah can continue to come through that lineage and also save the whole world. That was the purpose of God lifting him up. Many people don't know why God is lifting them up. So if you don't know the purpose of your destiny, you are going to misuse that destiny. And you would give an account to God because God would ask an account of that destiny. Brother Paul, when he became converted in the book of Acts chapter 9, in the Lord told him already what was his destiny and what was the purpose of his uh, destiny. In the book of uh, Acts chapter 9, uh, you can read it from verse 1 to verse uh, 19. Please read it, and you need to take an example of uh, Brother Paul. When the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he was not uh, saved. He was a pagan. And uh, he was persecuting the church because he did not know the purpose of the church. He thought the church was a, a sect. It was a cult. So he was persecuting the church, thinking it was uh, helping God to destroy this, uh, this, this sect. And Jesus said to him, soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? He did not even know that he was persecuting Jesus. And he said, who are you, Lord? So that's the first question that we need to ask when we are saved. Who are you, Lord? Reveal yourself to me. Reveal yourself to me. I want to know you more. There's a son that I always uh, sing. Reveal yourself to me. I want to know you more, more and more. Who are you, Lord? Reveal yourself to me. And through the Bible studies of the weekly mix, especially the perfect redemption plan, we are revealing who God is, his seven redemptive names. And God also will reveal himself to you in a specific way. Who are you, Lord? That's the first question that he asked God. You need to ask that question so that you may discover who he is in your life. And then Jesus said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to be kicking against the goats. There, so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what 
do you want me to do? So he understood that the fact that God has appeared to you, it is not just because you can have a great revelation and share with people, Jesus appeared to me. No, you have a part to play. What will you have me do? So ask God, with that destiny that you are revealing unto me, what is my part to play? What will you have me do in this marriage? What is my part to play to make it work well? As far as marriage is concerned, we have the foundation of a, for Christian marriage, we we apportion each one's uh, part to play if you want that uh, marriage to be uh, good because marriage is the will of God, the plan of God. God created marriage. That's your destiny. If you desire to be married, that's your destiny. So what is my part to do? What will you have me do? So he said to him, rise, uh, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So you'll be told what you must. So someone will tell you your destiny and what is the purpose for that destiny, what you are supposed to do. And then God, sometimes a man of God can tell you your destiny. A woman of God can tell you your destiny when you are a baby Christian. But as much as possible, I like people to discover their own destiny. Because when push would come to shove, when things would become tough, if it was a second-hand revelation, you would never have a personal conviction. That's why... Pastors should, when even it comes only to marriage, they should only introduce the people. They should not uh, uh, say to people, thou says the Lord, this is your wife, even if God has spoken, or this is your husband. Because people will tend now to not take responsibility. Whenever there's a problem, pastor, you said God, say that was my husband. Even if God said it, you have a part to play as a wife, you have a part to play as a, as a husband, and it is not God that was at fault, you did not play your part. Or God will reveal to you that you have this bright future and so on and so forth. It doesn't come to pass because you did not do your part. God is not a man that he should lie. So when it comes to marriage, so that people will not always come back to you for counseling, for counseling, for counseling, teach them the word of God. Even if God spoke to you that these two are meant to be together, you just introduce them and say, okay, talk and pray so that they can take responsibility. It is not the pastor that say that I do, you say that I do. And it is not God that say that I do, you say that I do. God would uh, show you someone that uh, would be the bone of your bone, the flesh of your flesh, meaning that you can have a destiny together and achieve your purpose on earth together. But if you don't want, like you said in Genesis chapter 24, God will find someone else for you. So, but you have a part to play. So what will you have me do? So immediately Paul went for three days and three nights. The Bible says, verse nine, for, uh, he was the three days without the sight and neither ate uh, nor uh, drank. So he was fasting the Esther fast for three days and three nights. God reveal unto me who you are. Reveal unto me what I should do. What is my destiny now that you have appeared to me? You say that you are the Lord the Jesus that I was persecuting. He fasted so that the Lord will reveal himself to him and tell him what to do. When God shows me a vision, I ask God, what is my part to do? Because I know that I have a part to play. So tell me so that I know very early. Some vision after an appointed time. I remember when I was 14 years old, I woke up and I had a, I had a vision at night. I was wearing a, a kilt and I was standing before cameras. And it was not our television uh, in, in Congo. It was uh, uh, international cameras and uh, the journalists. So I said to my mother, I woke up, I said to my mother, mother, I'm not serious. Among all your three sons, I'm not serious because one day you will see me wearing a kilt and I'll be standing before cameras and the whole world will be listening to me. My mom was just laughing. She says, you are not serious. But I had a vision like Joseph of uh, my destiny. Standing before cameras, not the small cameras of uh, Congo, uh, Brazzaville, but the cameras that are international that would, uh, I would be seen across the world but I did not know for what uh, reason, what was the purpose of God uh, putting me on TV. 
And then when I came to Scotland, our, the division now came to kill. We were talking about the Scotland. When I was in England doing the Bible course, I understood now the, the full meaning of the dream. Joseph understood the full meaning of the dream later on in his life. And I understood now the purpose of God putting me on TV so that I can non free in the UK and in YouTube and Europe so that those millions of souls can listen to what? The gospel of Jesus. So now I discovered the, the, gospel, the, the, the purpose of that destiny. Then I had to live a constrained life, disciplined life, so that that dream can come to pass. You need to discover what is your destiny and the reason for that destiny. Are you supposed to be married? Because marriage is not for all, everyone. If you desire marriage, you desire a good thing. If you don't desire marriage, God will not force marriage on you. And so why will you get married? And what is the purpose of that marriage? Just to have children? No. What is the destiny of those children? Because God wants me and my house to serve the Lord. He wants my family to represent uh, the relationship between Christ and the church because that's marriage. So he wants me to typify also the same relationship in my marriage to bring up godly offspring. That's the purpose. and. Uh, We've explained in, in length in that Bible study. So God spoke to Ananias, go tell Paul his destiny, soul of Tarsus, his destiny and the purpose of that destiny. So Ananias came and said, God said to him, verse 11, arise and go to the street called the straight. God gave the address and inquired in the house of Judas for uh, one called soul of Tarsus. Uh, for behold, he's a praying. Okay, and in a vision, he has a scene, a man named Ananias. So he already saw even Ananias coming and putting his hand on him uh, so that he might receive his uh, sight. So Ananias argued, we jump in uh, verse uh, 15. Then the Lord said to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. So God told the purpose of uh, the destiny of uh, Paul, the sort of Tarsus, and his uh, purpose. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name to the Gentiles. His apostleship to the Gentiles was already revealed from the day he was uh, born again. And many times uh, we are not teaching people the right way. They are 20 years in Christianity. They don't know why they are into the kingdom. They think that they are just there to warm the pews, to to have children, all that, but why are you having children? What is the destiny of those children? God wants to reveal to you what is the destiny of those children. When uh, um, Rebecca was pregnant with those twins, she asked the Lord, why is there like uh, wrestling in my belly? God said, there are two nations. Nations. She was giving birth to twins, but God said, they are already nations. Their destiny. Their destiny to become nations. And uh, the second one, the younger one would uh, uh, be greater than uh, the, the first one. And I'm going to bring the Messiah through the first one. So make sure that his father don't go, his father Isaac doesn't follow tradition because he would try, try to anoint uh, the first bone instead of the second one. But the Messiah will come through the second bone. So make sure that the second bone gets the blessing. And uh, you bet, Rebecca made sure that it was uh, Jacob that uh, collected uh, the blessing of Abraham, not uh, Esau. Because she knew the purpose and the destiny, even when her husband wanted to do this, to play and still anoint uh, Esau, she said, let the curse be upon me. We are going to deceive your, your, your father, but he will bless you because I know what God said to me about your destiny and the purpose of your destiny. The Messiah is supposed to come for your legion. You are going to become Israel, a nation, the people of God. So from the very beginning, and God also said the thing that he's going to go through, for he will, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and they revealed to Paul all those things about his destiny in Christ and the purpose. So that's what we want. 
in this Christianity. We need to seek the face of the Lord, like the soul of Tarsus. The moment he was born again, his deep three days and three nights of fasting, God, you need to reveal unto my destiny. Who are you, Lord? Who are you to me? Who are you to my family? Who are you in my marriage? And what will you have me do? What is my destiny? What is the purpose of that destiny? And what will you have me do to make this marriage work? Point number two, God called you by your name. And even from your mother's womb, you are born with a destiny. You are not an accident. You are not an accident. You are never going to be an accident. God called you from your mother's womb. Discover why you were born. Discover why you are married. Discover why you have children. What is the purpose to the destiny of those children? Discover what is the true name. Even my whole name is a prophetic. I did not understand it until God started to sit me down and explain to me. I know now the meaning, the meaning of Jerry, what it means. I know because I had the vision, and that vision, I was holding the spear, uh, iron spear. And when I came out of the, the baptismal water, that was in 2007, and there was a swimming pool. And all the flags of Europe, the elders of Europe, the 50 elders of Europe, each one representing the nation of Europe with um, uh, a flag, a pole with the flag of the, the, the nation, they bowed uh, with the flags. It is one of the Bible, my weekly Bible study. So I say, okay, why am I holding the iron spear in my, in, my, in my right hand? My brother being a prophet, he understood. So Jerry actually means a mighty king ruling with an iron spear. So I, I now discover, oh, even my name was a prophet. My mom was giving names, but she did not understand why. Why with that particular spelling? So is your name. You God called you by your name, not your parents. God called you by your name. He knew you from your mother's womb. You are born with a purpose. You have a destiny. God said to Jeremiah today, saying to you in Jeremiah chapter uh, 1, verse 4 to verse 5, you can read. Uh, if you read the entirety of Jeremiah chapter 1, you will see the purpose of uh, the calling of Jeremiah, the purpose of his destiny. He was to, uh, to pull down, to, to chop down some kingdoms. But in verse uh, 5 to 4 to 5, it is uh, uh, the destiny. But further down, it is uh, the purpose for that destiny, to destroy the works of darkness, the kingdom of uh, darkness. So God said to him, behold, I formed you in the womb of your mother. I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart. You are consecrated even from your mother's womb. I ordained you a prophet. Whatever you are, it was not mankind. Mankind only discovered what God already placed, it, placed in you. Just like gold. Gold has always been there. Under that, uh, that uh, soil. Now, when mankind comes and digs around, they find, oh, there's gold here. We have a mine, gold mine here. That gold has always been here. People were just ignorant that gold was there. You have this treasure in that earthen vessel. God never created anyone without depositing something precious in that person. You have a talent. You are born with a talent. You are born with a destiny. Discover that destiny. Like people discover gold that is uh, hidden under a pile of dirt. And everybody will be rushing to you. Just like when they discovered gold in America, there was that gold rush in America. When they discovered the black gold in Texas, there was that gold, the, the, gold, uh, the black gold rush in Texas. God has deposited something in you. He ordained you. Whatever he, he ordained you to be, be the prophet for Paul, Paul was ordained an apostle from his mother's womb to the nations. Paul, it was a two. Uh, the European nations, West Europe. That's what God uh, did for you. And uh, Isaiah chapter 40, uh, 45, verse uh, 4, God says, the one that named you, not your parent. He says, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. God is saying, I have even called you by your name. 
I have named you, though you have not known me. So when your parents were naming you, you did not even know God yet, but it was God that was naming you. You were born with a destiny. Discover a destiny and discover also the purpose of that destiny in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, point number three. God has already declared the end from the beginning. Isaiah chapter 43, uh, verse 10, tells us declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, verse 10. So God has already declared the end from the beginning. Just like your parents, they've paid for the tuition fees for you to go and finish that college, finish that degree. As far as they are concerned, you've already graduated. In the mind of God, you've already graduated. Now you need to cooperate with God so that his counsel can stand also in your life. I need to cooperate with God so that his counsel can stand in my personal life, in the house of prayer for all nations. I know the destiny of the house of prayer for all nations is to dash all the powers of darkness in these 50 European nations and then throne crown uh, Christ Jesus as the king over this continent. I know the destiny of the house of prayer for all nations is to lead millions to Christ, 300,000 families that are going to give their life to Christ just here in Scotland. They would come from all over the place to give their life just like the Solomon. They uh, come all the way from, uh, from uh, the Atlantic to go and lay the eggs in the Tweed, Tweed River here in Scotland, going towards Inverness. And they go back to the Atlantic Ocean. They would go back as they receive Christ here in Glasgow, Scotland. They would go back to Europe to bring Christ. So I know the purpose for God filling stadiums with the house of prayer for all nations. It's not just filling for the sake of filling those stadiums so that they can bring back a Christ to Europe. God has called. So he has already declared the end from the beginning. Now, my, my part to place to do like uh, uh, Paul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, as I was so fast and I pray, God, what will you have me? You've revealed that destiny. I need to cooperate with you. What will Jerry have to do here so that it will come to pass, so that your counsel will stand and you will do all your pleasure to save all those souls because it's already the destiny of everyone to be saved. That's why Christ died, to save everyone. Now, we need to work with God so that those people can be saved and not go to hell. In your marriage, God has already destined for that marriage to work, then you need to cooperate with God for that counsel to stand. In your finances, God are already destined for you to be successful, but you need to cooperate with God for that counsel to stand. Point number uh, four, Jesus knew his destiny and he knew his purpose in life. My question is, do you know your destiny? And do you know your purpose in life? Jesus knew it. Jeremiah knew it. Paul knew it. Jesus, so we will take the example of Jesus. He knew his purpose. When he was born in John chapter, in Luke chapter 2, prophecies were made over uh, his life by Simeon and uh, Hannah. And his mother pondered it uh, in her heart. When the angel Gabriel appeared to you, to Mary in uh, Luke chapter one. The angel Gabriel also told Mary the destiny of that child and the purpose for which he was born to save mankind. The soul that appears the side of, and also said to Mary what she would go through the pain because of that child. God will reveal to you the destiny of your children My parents knew our destiny. So in the phone, like we, we saw yesterday on Saturday, 
those who listen to that whole Bible study, I might not have uh, mentioned it, but it was in that recording, or uh, you can read it. You need to discover your destiny and the fullness of the time God came and God came and uh, took my brother and, uh, and myself to come and preach the gospel. My mom was not happy for because she has trained us to do something else. She paid our tuition fees to, to study and do other things. But God said, thank you for that. Just like Joseph and Mary, they trained uh, Jesus to be a carpenter. But in the fullness of the time, God came. This is my son. I've come to take him to preach the gospel. You need to know why you were born. To have whatever qualification you need. And Jesus was a professional uh, carpenter. He could um, do a wonderful roof, a wonderful uh, uh, flooring, a wonderful uh, chair, wonderful table. He was a wonderful carpenter. And that was not his real destiny. That's what his parents wanted me to do. And he had to submit to his parents. And he had to be able to feed himself as well, instead of begging. So Jesus knew his destiny. We have it in the book of, uh, uh, and his purpose. We have it in the book of Mark chapter one, verse 38. Uh, Jesus says, let us go to the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose, I have come. He knew that one of the purposes of his coming was to preach the gospel of salvation so that people can be saved. And that is the purpose of every believer. I've explained that in the perfect redemption plan. We are all here to save our family, starting with our own family members. There is a lamb per household. And when the household is too small, we invite our neighbors. That's why we are adding all, all the other uh, people in our list of 10 people. We all have the same purpose when we are born again to save, to seek and save the lost, to, to share, to be witnesses of Christ. Not to be preachers, but we are all supposed to be witnesses of Christ. So he knew his purpose. He said, for this purpose I have come, to preach, that I may preach. In John chapter 12, verse 27, in John chapter 12, verse 27, he says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, Save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. He knew also the time and the season and the purpose for that time and for that season. We already covered the time and the season, so you need to revisit that Bible study. I won't go into that again. But he knew now also the purpose for that season, the purpose for him going to the cross. Me going to detention, me being arrested. God already showed me that in 2009 when I was in Bible college. And I said to the people, the day is coming where I'll be bound for the sake of the gospel. He said, oh, brother, you don't say this. You don't know what you are saying because God said that to me. So I knew I had no way to escape. Like uh, Paul also in uh, Acts chapter 20 and Acts chapter 21, God revealed to him. So he knew he faced that imprisonment. So when I was now in Dungevo, the church member came and decided to weep. I said, what do you mean by weeping? Have you not listened to the Bible? And Lynn that week also published that Bible study. So they heard it that week before I went to Donkey. I said, have you not read and or listened to what Lynn uh, Jazz has published this week? I already mentioned that in those Bible studies. I know what the events are supposed to happen. So that's why I'm confident that I'm going to come out of this uh, Donkey. Because God has already declared the end from the beginning. I know I'm going to win. The lawyer rejected my case, but it really does not matter. Who is he who says the thing and it comes to pass when God has not declared it? Let God be true. And every man alive, including the lawyer, including the advocate that rejected my case, there was no case to try. I won. I represented myself. No lawyer. Christ Jesus became my advocate. Give the fan. Because I knew what I've seen. I knew what I've heard. I knew the outcome. So don't give up, could not shake me. Jesus knew his purpose. So he knew the other purpose that he came here was to die on the cross. And without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sin. When you know your purpose, when you know your destiny and you know the purpose, you are going to be focused in your race. 
you are going to be very disciplined because you know where you are going. In your marriage, you know where you are going. With your children, you know where you are going. In your business, you know where you are going. In Jesus' mighty name. So discover that purpose. Jesus knew it. You need to know it. Now, point number five. Sin will defeat the purpose of God in your life and will cut short your destiny. Sin will defeat the purpose of God in your life and cut short your destiny and cut short my destiny. The purpose of, of Reuben, he was the firstborn. God's destiny for him was that the Messiah will come for Reuben as the firstborn. The double portion was his and the blessing of Abraham was his. But sexual sin dis uh, disqualified him from the destiny that he had. Samson ordained to be even a Nazarite from his mother's womb, to be the deliverer of Israel, the judge. Sexual sin, marrying, and he was, he was not restrained because he could not see the purpose of God for his destiny. He knew his destiny was to be the deliverer of Israel, mighty man, yes, but the purpose, the reason why. People want the power. They don't know why they want that power. Or some people even complain, why me? Find someone else. I just want to live a loose life. Well, if you don't want that power, God will take it away from you. Since you don't meet the requirement, you don't play your part. What will you have to do? Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And he went and married a Philistine. Even his father said to him, no, my son. If you don't find one in our tribe, there are other 12 tribes in Israel. It is not about a uh, uh, tribe. It's not about even the skin color. In Israel, there are all shades and colors. Israel was never about a race. Israel was about a God. So that's why they, they were black Jews, uh, white Jews, even today, black Jews, white Jews, uh, uh, brown Jews, uh, yellow Jews. Choose of all shades and colors because it was never about the race. It was about the God Yahweh that they were serving. As long as the people serve Yahweh, you can marry them. But don't go marry with someone who is not in the covenant because they are going to turn your heart away. He said, no, I have all this power. I can't do anything. So he married the Philistine did not work. And then he started to visit the prostitutes in Gaza. And then after that, the prostitute started now to visit Delilah, live in fornication with Delilah. He had a zero sanctification in his life. Pursue peace with all men. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. And holiness without which no one will see God. You will not see God moving in your life. Samson, since you don't respect the holiness, I am a holy God. You don't see things the way I'm saying. Okay, let me take back my power. And the day came, he shook himself. God was no longer with him. They put off his eyes and they bound him. He died prematurely. He, he repented, but he cut short his destiny. He killed the 3,000 people while he died with them. But that was not the plan of God. So not just he shortened the deliverance of his, uh, he shortened his own destiny, but he also shortened the deliverance of Israel. It was after his death, it took a, a decades for God to raise another deliverer. It takes time for God to train someone. It takes time. It takes time for God to train someone. It took uh, almost 80 years for God to train Moses. The first 40 years, Moses did a mistake and then ran away, he killed someone out in the flesh. So God took another 40 years to train him at the back of the desert. It takes time for God to train a person. And God does not have someone else. I remember the Holy Ghost coming, the Holy Ghost was weeping. The Holy Ghost weeps. When you get close to the Holy Spirit, you would know he's a feeling. That's why, he's, he's, that's why God says, the only blast uh, sin that is not going to be forgiven is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. You can insult the Father. If you confess, you are going to be forgiven. You can insult and do any kind of thing against Jesus. But against the Holy Ghost, God is very protective with the Holy Ghost. Don't grieve him. 
the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost will never be forgiven. So the Holy Ghost came and was weeping. And when he wanted to talk to me to see how serious God sees the sexual sin, he said, Jerry never sinned against me like David and despised me when he went with Bathsheba. Because he was called by my name. Everybody knew that he was a man after my own heart. So when he did it, my name was uh, put to shame as well. Don't never despise me. He said, and I have no one else but you for your generation. What God has called you to do, no one else can do that. You are not to copy of someone else. You have a unique destiny in Christ. So don't think that because you did not uh, do your part that God will find someone else. No. Because for that generation, you are that woman that God called. You are that man that God called. And if you stand for that generation, you are going to lead in millions of So imagine if Raina Banke did not stand for his generation. He has led for the past next 15, uh, past 15 years, he had led more than 70 million souls to Christ. Those souls would have never received the Christ if Raina Bunker did not uh, rise up. Now, discipling them is another issue, but that is them coming into the kingdom. That was his assignment. Discipling them, that's the assignment of the different local churches. He, he did his part. He entered into his destiny. He cooperated with God. And millions. Imagine if Billy Graham did not enter into his call. He entered into his call and he led millions of souls. He was going to in Bible college, you know, when our American Bible college, and then they had a trip in, uh, in Europe, in England, to, to visit England. And then they were visiting, so I don't know which town it was. They went to a bus with uh, that, 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 that professor. And then they visited now the house of uh, uh, Wesley, the Methodist founder. So as they entered the door, they showed them the kitchen, they showed them the living room, they showed the uh, study uh, room, and then they, they went also upstairs. Now they showed uh, the bedroom of uh, Wesley. And then one of the students re uh, realized there was a, on the carpet, there was a place where the carpet had been worn out and you could see the wood. Uh, and then he asked, well, why is the carpet worn out at, at this uh, side of the, of the room? He said, oh, actually every morning, that's where Wesley would kneel down and uh, pray. So it was at the head of uh, the other head of the, of the bed. So he would kneel down and be putting his hand on the, the head of the bed and be praying. So he had knelt down there for so long that his knees have left an imprint on, uh, uh, so basically has even torn the carpet so it reached even, even uh, the wood. So when that, it was Professor Orr, when Professor Orr finished the tour of the, that Wesley residence, so they went downstairs and they started to board the, the, the bus again. So Professor Orr was counting everybody, one, two, three, four. And then they realized that one person was missing in the bus. So he went back, he looked in the kitchen, nobody looked uh, in the living room, nobody looked in the toilet, nobody, and he went upstairs. When he went upstairs, because the head of the bed was uh, about here, so. When you kneel uh, behind the, the head of the, the bed, you only see your, 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 your upper part of the head. So Professor Ork could see from the entrance of the, of, the, of the bedroom, the head of that uh, guy, but he could not see the face. And he could now listen to the prayer of that guy. And that young man was saying, whatever you did with Wesley, do it also with me. Whatever you did with Wesley, I'm available. If you can use anyone, use me. So Professor Orr came and tapped that young man. He said, it is okay. It is okay. Because he could see the agony of the prayer of that young man. He tapped on his shoulder. He said, it is okay. It is okay. Let's uh, stand up and go back. The tour is finished. So that young man stood up, entered the, 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 the post with uh, uh, all the other students. That young man went back to America. His name was uh, Billy Graham. And we know what God did with him. He led millions of souls to Christ in his own generation. What God did with Wesley, God also was looking for someone that was willing to yield himself to be used. And he was a Baptist. God is not into denomination. Denominationalism is what man made. God did not make the denominations. So Wesley was a Methodist. 
Billy Graham was a Baptist, but he prayed that the God of the Baptist would be the same for the Methodist. The God of the Methodist would be the same for the Baptist. And God is no respecter of person. If you seek him with all your heart, you are going to find him, like he said to Jeremiah. Not a half-baked heart. You put to your whole heart in it. So, sin will defeat the, uh, the purpose of God in our life and cut short our destiny. John is explaining to us in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 to verse 8. He says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices a sin. So, so, so sorry, he who practices righteousness is righteous, just like he also is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning and for this purpose. The son of God was manifested that he might destroy the work of the devil. So the other purpose for which Christ was manifested or revealed or born was to destroy sin in our life. So if you have Christ and if I have Christ and I don't understand that the purpose of Christ coming into my life is to destroy sin, I don't understand why I received Christ. He destroyed the Adamic nature. He made us righteous. He imputed his righteousness unto us. And now he wants us to live a righteous life. If you want the anointing of God to work in your life, to fulfill that destiny that you have, if you want the anointing of God to work powerfully in your life, to break the yoke of bondage in your life, the yoke of bondage in your finances, the yoke of bondage in your family, the yoke of bondage, and the burden of the devil in your business, in whatever you are doing, you will need to hate sin because God hates sin. Uh, for God, Jesus, it is said in the Hebrews chapter one, verse nine, you have loved righteousness. So you need to love righteousness and practice it. And uh, hated lawlessness or hated iniquity, hated transgression, and hated sin. You need to hate sin with passion because God hates it. That's the purpose of Jesus in your life to destroy sin transgression, iniquity in your life and in my life. This is not just to preach. We saw in John, his purpose was to preach. The other purpose was to, uh, to die on the cross so that you may deal with sin in your life and in my life because sin is this, uh, defeating the purpose of God in our life and cutting short our destiny. So Jesus, he hated lawlessness. He loved righteousness. He loved practicing righteousness. Now, therefore, Therefore, the reason to so we draw a conclusion because he hated lawlessness and he loved righteousness, he loved to practice righteousness. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed him with the oil of gladness more than all his companions. You want to be anointed in business, anointed in ministry more than all the other preachers, all your competition. You need to hate sin, a perfect hatred for sin. Many people, they they are, not all, they are only inconvenienced by sin. They don't hate it. That's why for them, uh, me, I weep. There are some things that I weep for that people say, why are you weeping? I remember when my pastor friend, his son who was also a Christian, decided to impregnate a woman that was a pagan. Why should he marry a pagan or not marry a pagan? His parents say, I explained to him why. But I said, no, I love her. Blah, blah, blah. Today they are divorced. I thought you loved her. Why now are you divorced? So he went ahead and faked the conversion. So they went to church. He said to that, 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 that lady, I'm going to my past. Let's go to my past, uh, the friend of my, my, my father, who is also a pastor. So when he would make an altar call, just go forward and raise your hand and repeat that prayer. Then everybody would know that you, you gave your life to Christ. And you can say to my father that you gave your life to Christ in that church of his friend. So she went and played that game. So now, but his father said, I know that she's not born again. So now to, to, do, to spite his father, he decided to impregnate. Uh, already they were living in fornication. So he impregnated that, that lady so that he would force the parents send it to, so that he can marry. What the Bible says, if you impregnated someone, go and marry. The Deuteronomy chapter 24 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So they, they said to go and marry at the registry. So he went and he got what he wanted. 
But when I heard the news, my, my pastor friend of mine, we knelt down and we wept. We were weeping as if we were bereaved because we knew that the heart of God was grieved, the Holy Ghost was grieved. That's how Solomon also grieved the spirit because the Bible says, the amplified version, Solomon deliberately disobeyed God. It was a deliberate, and no, not, not the, 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 the word that he used in the amplified, he defiantly, he knew what was right. He knew God forbade him to be an equally yoke even believer. So the amplifier said, Solomon defiantly disobeyed God by marrying the, the, the people that God forbade that we should marry. That was the beginning of his downfall. And now when, after a year, they had a baby with that girl, the girl now left, left him and so on and so forth. So he called me, Pastor Jerry, I don't know what happened. So it's pointless to say that uh, we told you before, okay, we are praying, we are praying. Now two years, they are no longer together. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So there are things that would cause the Holy Spirit to weep. Other people will not weep over it, but I weep over it because I know how God is heartbroken over those. If you don't hate sin, forget about the anointing. You'll have uh, the second hand, third hand, and fourth hand anointing. But for the anointing to work in your life, you need to hate sin with passion, the way God hates it. It needs to be as if uh, it, it is a person of you. You need to hate it with so much passion. And uh, uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 10, verse 27, he says, uh, It shall come to pass in that day that the burden. Uh, will be taken away from your shoulders and the yoke uh, from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. So you need the anointing. And for it to work, you need to be like, you need to hate sin with passion. Many churches that are always preaching uh, that wishy-washy salvation, where well, you can continue to live anyhow, there is no power in it. People go to deliverance and the healing in ministries where they believe in holiness. And once they have the deliverance, they go back to those lukewarm churches. But they are allowing them to live anyhow, not telling them to people are more concerned about the tithe and the, the offering. But whenever there is a problem, they know where to get the, the power to be delivered. They will go to ministries that to preach salvation. Uh, 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 holiness, you would always see the power of God to deliver to heal. Because the anointing, God would increase his anointing because you hate sin like Jesus hates it. With perfect, David said he hated it with perfect hatred. He does not hate the people, but he hates it. But he loves the sin. He died for the sinner, but he, hate, he hates the um, uh, the, the, the sin that they are committing. He wants them to change. He wants me to change in Jesus' name. Now, point number six. We want to know what is the reason that the devil wants me to continue in sin? Because there is a reason. He's profiting the, the devil for me to continue to live in sin. What is the reason that the devil, why the devil wants me to continue in sin? When we practice a sin, two things happen. Our conscience starts accusing us. And the devil is the accuser of the brethren. You'd accuse him now. You, 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 you are not worthy to receive it. But you, whatever you are praying for, you are not worthy to receive it. So Romans chapter 2, verse 15, Paul tells us that uh, your thoughts will either be accusing you or excusing you. So the enemy wants you to continue to live in sin so that your conscience, your thoughts will be accused. When you are praying, you know so many things against yourself. And your heart will be condemning you. John tells us in 1 John, chapter, because the book of John is written to little children, so baby in the faith, not just baby in the faith, but also adolescents that are acting like brats, spoiled children of God. That's why he, say, he always says in the book of First John, my little children, my little children, my little children, take me on. 
that in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 to verse 21, he says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. You see, the plan of the devil is so that you and me, so you and I can continue in sin so that our conscience will be accusing us, our heart will be condemning us. So when we come in the place of prayer, we don't have confidence. We are disqualifying ourselves. I think I cannot receive it. I think I cannot receive it. Thank God that my pastor settled these things early in our Christian life. And it was very, very important for us. Because when my brother became mad and uh, fell from the second story of the building, he was paralyzed from neck to toe. My pastor was in Angola. He was uh, in, uh, in prison because he decided to take the citizenship of the DRC. He's from Congo Brazzaville, but uh, the law sent him to DRC. So law told him as well, you are never going back to Congo Brazzaville. So I want you to identify with the people and become uh, Congolese from DRC. So he took the citizenship from, uh, from DRC. But at that time, DRC had a problem with Angola. So when he came to Angola to preach and he had the DRC passport, not the Congolese or Brazzaville passport. So they took him also as someone from DRC and they put him in jail. He was six months in jail. So uh, we could not call the pastor. We told someone that uh, our brother is uh, uh, sick. And so, so that, that local pastor that was from Angola went and saw him in prison and told him. But for the six months, we prayed ourselves. It was in 2006 that it happened. So we prayed ourselves. We prayed for the madness to leave. We prayed for him to be healed and to start walking. Thank God he taught us the word of God. He made the disciple of us, not a church, me a church goers. The day will come when you will pick up your phone. The pastor will be doing a crusade in Tanzania. And there's no network in Kazura Mimba. Or the time will come, you will call the pastor will be in India, doing a crusade in India. And in that village, there will be no network. So what will you do? Will you bury your son? Will you let your son remain mad because your conscience is accusing you, your heart is condemning you? So when you come in prayer now, you'll be, oh, God, forgive me. Forgive me for this. Forgive me for that. So you made, you built up your faith for two weeks. This is what, this is, what is happening. You built up your faith for two weeks. Now you had faith because the confidence that now has come. You know nothing against yourself. And then you fall again in sin. And then, oh God, I'm not worthy. Forgive me. It takes you two weeks again to build up your faith so that your conscience is clear. Again, your heart is no longer condemning you. And then you sin again. So what you are doing is uh, two step forward, two step backward. So you are just stagnant. You are having the motion, but uh, it is either a circle, going in a circle, or just stagnation. Two step forward, two step backward. And then you would... Uh, Try this time, I'll go for a whole month without sinning, and you go for a whole month, and then you sin again, and your conscience brings you backward for two weeks again. You are delaying your promise. Galatians chapter 4, Paul says to us that uh, the slave does not differ from uh, an heir as long as the heir is still a child, he's acting like a baby. So God will still be waiting. Okay, you cannot handle it right now. You need to, to grow and have some maturity. Because if I release your destiny right now, that destiny is going to destroy you. You can't handle it. But when your heart is not accusing, that's point number seven. Come boldly before the Lord and inquire about your destiny and the purpose of that destiny. Hebrews chapter. 10 verse uh, 35 it says, therefore, do uh, okay, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. That's why the enemy is wanting you to sin, because he's after your confidence. When your conscience is accusing your heart is condemning you, it is destroying your confidence. And without confidence, you can't pray in faith. So basically, it is not truly after you sinning, it's after your confidence. And the only way to rob you of your that confidence, to take away that, uh, to cast the, that you would cast away that confidence when you are coming in the place of prayer is to cause you to sin. 
we Paul says we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. Because by the time you repent, now you start dealing with the guilt and the condemnation. It will take you weeks, a month, two, to go back to that level of faith that you had before you sinned. And years are going. Someone else will get that contract. Someone else will get that, that, that thing that you were praying for. You go back at point zero again. Because it's after your confidence. So then Paul says to us in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6, when we have that confidence that we are not in those things, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When your heart is no longer accusing you, your conscience is no longer con uh, con uh, condemning you. You are confident when you come. You are bold when you come in the place of prayer. Even when you are praying, you are bold because you know nothing against yourself. I say again, you know nothing against yourself. Of Paul, Paul says in the first Corinthians chapter four, verse four. First Corinthians chapter four, verse four. It says, for I know nothing against myself. Yet, I am not justified by this, you know, but, he who judges me is the Lord. So he said to people, when I'm standing here to preach to you, I know nothing against myself. Jesus puts it another way. In, uh, uh, in uh, John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus puts it another way. Jesus says, the prince of uh, uh, the power of the air is coming, or the rule of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. You can check me. I have nothing of the devil in me. So he cannot make some reclamation in my life. The devil cannot claim anything in my life. I know nothing. Paul said, I know nothing against myself. Search me, examine me. I know nothing against myself. Paul was saying to the young Timothy's disciples, the reason God gave us the commandments is so that we can have a faith with a pure conscience and a clean heart. So when we are coming in a place of prayer, we know nothing against ourselves. Nothing is condemning us. Our heart is clean. We don't have ulterior motives in our relationship, in businesses, in the church. We have a pure heart towards people, clean hands and a pure heart. That's why God gave commandment because the enemy is after your confidence and your confidence has a greater reward because faith, if you don't have confidence, your faith won't work of uh, Paul, even the demon will know that uh, they have nothing against you. In the book of Acts chapter 19 from verse uh, 15, you can read the whole book of Acts chapter 19, but we are just going to focus on verse 15. We know the story, the sons of Sceva, they saw that uh, even the handkerchief of uh, Paul was casting out demon and healing the sick. So they also decided, let us copy. But the Bible said they were sons of Biliad. Sons of Belial were mentioned the first time in the book of Judges and then in the book of uh, uh, Samuel, it's Samuel chapter, first Samuel chapter 2, talking about uh, the sons of Eli. Sons of Belial were those that were sexually immoral, financial manipulator. And uh, the sons of Eli, they were sleeping with the women in the temple. And then they were stealing money from uh, uh, the, taking more offering than they were supposed to do. So, Sexual immoralities and financial manipulation, God called them with, uh, sons of Belia. So these sons of Sceva, the priests also, they were referred to as the sons of Belia. So that was also the lifestyle. No holiness at all. And they wanted to cast out the demon. And then the demon said to them, in, uh, that was inside that man, he said to them, look, wait for a minute. Jesus, I know him. I know Jesus. Paul also I know. But who are you? Tell me, please. Don't I see fornication in your own life? And fornication belongs to me. Don't I see financial manipulation in the spirit of Balaam and also belongs to me? You have things that belong to me in your life. But Jesus could say, the prince, the ruler of this world comes. He has nothing in me. Check me. And Paul also could say, I know nothing against myself. You can check me. I know nothing against myself. That's why we know him. And how do they know Paul and Jesus? The Bible is clear in the book of Matthew chapter 7 from 16 to 20. 
That's the same way we know any believer, whether they are true believer or fake believers. It has not to change. It is the same way also God and the angel and demons, they know if you are truly a believer or a fake one. And if I'm Jerry, I'm truly a believer or a fake one, Jesus says, so take it home. It is from Jesus. It is right in your Bible. He says, you will know them by the fruits. Do men gra uh, uh, gather grapes from uh, thorn bushes or figs from uh, thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. If you are, according to the book of Isaiah, the tree of righteousness, the planting of the law, then you will bear the fruit of righteousness. That's what John the Baptist was saying to them. Now practice righteousness because you've become a tree of righteousness. You cannot be a fig tree and uh, be bearing uh, thistles. No. So, even so, a good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. The good tree cannot bear bad fruit. So that's why Paul said, examine yourself whether you are still in the faith or not. The sin that I listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 10 should not be ours in the name of Jesus. The appearance of evil, you should get away from it because it would put accusations in your, uh, in your mind and condemnation in your heart, which would rob you of your confidence in the place of prayer. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit either. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, completely cut down and thrown into the fire, even a hell fire. Verse 20, therefore, the conclusion of this, uh, this uh, discourse is, by the fruits, you shall know them. Not by church attendance, though we ought to attend the church. Not by giving a tithe and offering, though we ought to, to do those things. You ought to have done all those things. But God wants you and me to bear fruit. He wants us to bear fruit. Point number eight. When you have confidence in the place of prayer, when you know nothing against yourself, when the enemy has nothing, in your life to claim whatever you are going to ask. Hallelujah. You are going to receive it. You see why the enemy is after your confidence? Do you know why he wants you to sin? Because he doesn't want you to receive from the Lord. And John explains to us in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. 1 John chapter uh, 5, verse 14 to 15. I remember in 2008, the general version of the ministry where I was, uh, Paul Genodu, his wife is my spiritual mother. He shared that thing. It dawned in me. I remember that. I, I, I can have whatever I say. And this is the condition. He said, now this is the confidence. Hallelujah. If the enemy can rob you of your confidence, you are going to receive nothing. And you're always going to find for someone else to stand in the gap that has clean hands and a pure heart. Whose uh, uh, conscience is not accusing him. Whose heart is not condemning him. He says, now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, whatever it is, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we are not doubting because my mind is not accusing, my, car, my, my heart is not condemning, maybe God will not do that for me because I know so many things against myself, I know nothing against myself. So if we know that he hears us, then we have the petition. So whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. It is powerful. Christianity is so simple that people complicate it. But I want you to seek the face of the Lord. We are going to continue now with practical cases. Part two, we are going to see Father Abraham in his life, his destiny, his purpose. And we are going to see Joseph, his destiny, his purpose. We are going to see other examples. So the part two will be about Abraham. We are spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. So we are going to see our spiritual destiny, the purpose of it, the physical one as well. God, according to his divine uh, grace, uh, Peter told us, he has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Your destiny is already settled. And the purpose of it, God wants to reveal it to you. 
the only enemy. God does not worry about the devil too much. That's why even God declared the end from the beginning because he knows Satan cannot stop it. The only person that can sabotage his destiny or her destiny is uh, each one of us. Not even your neighbor, not even your mother, not even your father. We. That's why we take responsibility. That's why God said, if my people, if my people who are called by my name, he didn't say if the devil stopped troubling them, the devil would always trouble them. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, to steal your marriage, to kill your health, to kill your marriage, to kill your children. That is his job. But if my people, God is always talking about his people. If my people were called by my name, they would humble themselves and they would pray. Then I would hear from heaven. I would forgive the iniquity. I would heal the land. When you discover the reason why the devil wants you to do some things and what is going to cause you to go to rob you of your, your reward, your great reward, not just any reward, your great reward. Because with your faith, you can move any mountain in your life. So my prayer is that you are going to seek the face of the Lord. I'm going to seek the face of the Lord. God, give me the vision of my destiny and its purpose. Give me the vision of my marriage and its purpose. Give me the vision of my wife and a purpose in my life. Give me the vision of my husband and a purpose in my life. Give me the vision of my children and the purpose in this life. Give me the vision of my business, the, uh, the destiny of my business and the purpose for that destiny. In Joseph, we are going to explain many things, especially when it comes to finance, uh, financial power, the purpose of it. If I'm not, I don't know the purpose of that great destiny. I'm going to destroy that destiny. My prayer is that this month, we are going to pray and seek the face of the Lord. So write down what you want to ask God about uh, that destiny and that purpose for yourself, for your children, for your business, like uh, in the book of Ezra, chapter 8, Ezra decided to humble themselves. They would humble themselves at the river Ahava, that they would seek the right way, the right way for themselves, for the little ones, and for the cattle, the business. So seek the face of the Lord. He will reveal your destiny to you. You don't have to wait 20 years. Paul, the first day he was born, after three days, he prayed, he fasted, God revealed to him his destiny and the purpose of it. Who shall it be? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory and all the praise for your sons and your daughters under the sound of my voice. Father, you created each one of us with a specific destiny and a purpose. We came here on earth. You knew us from our mother's womb. You already sanctified us, set us apart. We should not be ignorant of the device. We should not be ignorant of what the enemy is planning to do so that we can cast away our confidence because that's a greater recompense, a reward. And Father, if we have that confidence, we will be able to move mountain. We're going to receive, we are going to receive whatever we ask of you. My king and myself, be it in marriage, in finances, in our education, in our studies, in our immigration, in the, the church. Father, you are going to do exceedingly abundantly above what we are asking you, above what we are thinking. To you be all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' precious name. Huh? Amen. So we are going to continue next Sunday with that in the mighty name of Jesus.